WWE Developmental, where stars of tomorrow are accumulated, cultivated, and constructed for the bright lights of sports entertainment. NXT, by design, gives one of the WrestleMania main eventers as real a feel as possible before they land an opportunity at Raw or SmackDown success. From there, well, the word success is open to interpretation. The black and gold brand isn't WWE's first conveyor belt to gorilla position, as the company has often worked alongside proving ground promotions like Evolve, Florida Championship Wrestling, and Ohio Valley Wrestling, to name but three. There is, however, one such promotion that is seldom talked about, probably because it lasted less than two years before WWE pulled the plug on the whole thing, and probably because the owner took WWE to court over it. Despite being with us for merely 565 days, this territory developed several future WWE champions, as well as having a hand in an AEW World Champion and even a WrestleMania main eventer. My name is Tom Campbell from Cultaholic Wrestling, and this is the history of Deep South Wrestling. The origin of DSW takes us back to 1986. Missouri-born Jody Hamilton, known in Georgia Championship Wrestling as The Assassin, opened a small independent promotion operating out of the same state, working in partnership with Vern Gagne's AWA. Hamilton wasn't just behind the scenes running the show, though. In order to keep talent costs down, Hamilton was wrestling under a mask on the majority of the events as well. It was during one of those double-shifting evenings that Hamilton suffered a career ending back injury. Left unable to work in and out of the ring, Deep South Wrestling was sold to an investor who almost immediately closed it forever, bizarrely. When Hamilton recovered from his injury, he began working for WCW. He was keen to build future wrestling champions and was the driving force behind the opening of The Power Plant, WCW's in-house performance center. This revolutionary wrestling school opened its doors in 1989 and under the watchful eye of Hamilton was where the skills of future stars like Diamond Dallas Page, Kevin Nash, and Bill Goldberg would be honed. There were mixed reviews of the power plant over the years. Many would proudly boast on podcasts how it was the making of them. Others would compare it to the toughest of military training camps. Some would even say the power plant was outright dangerous. But I feel that's another story for another time. When WCW was grabbed from the bargain bin in 2001 by the World Wrestling Federation, the power plant closed up shop. Hamilton did continue to train wrestlers. He was part of Ohio Valley Wrestling for a time, the promotion being used as a proving ground for future stars of WWF. Now, you would have thought that the team that trained and prepped guys like John Cena, Randy Orton, Batista, and Brock Lesnar would be in Vince McMahon's good books. But truth be told, they were very rarely even on the Christmas card list. Ongoing frustrations between OVW and WWF led to their partnership dissolving in 2005. WWE wanted more control over the booking and presentation of the talent in their feeder group, and ultimately, less of the insubordination they faced from OVW. Again, another video for another time. So they turned to proven star maker Jody Hamilton. You see, Jody embodied a lot of the similar values that Vince McMahon has when it comes to what makes a wrestling champion. Back in his power plant days, Jody would ask prospective trainees just three questions in their interview. Have you got previous wrestling experience? How old are you? And how tall are you? Jody, like Vince McMahon, was partial to big sweaty men. Admit it, you started singing the song, didn't you? I see you. This led to the rebirth of Jody Hamilton's wrestling baby, the one that he had to give up back in the late 80s, Deep South Wrestling. It would be a training facility that would double up as a TV studio where the magic would happen. Alongside Jody was legendary NWA Wildside promoter Bill Behrens, who was there to develop characters for TV, and Bill DeMott, formerly Hugh Morris of WCW. He was helping train the roster the WWE way. Jody was the overall operations manager and the on-screen owner of Deep South Wrestling. 
From the very beginning, there was tension as the whole operation was being put together as quickly and cheaply as possible. This led to issues at every level, from getting technical equipment for the TV tapings, setting up distribution on regional broadcasters, to even forgetting to hire referees until almost the 11th hour. The company was comprised predominantly of WWE developmental talent, with a few guys that Jody and his team liked the look of too. WWE were ultimately the paymasters and had substantial control over who did what and when. This was an ideal situation for Vince McMahon to have somewhere that sports entertainers could find their voice before getting a run on Raw and SmackDown and less bother than Ohio Valley Wrestling gave him. The first show from the brand spanking new Deep South Wrestling emanated from the Deep South Arena on September the 1st, 2005. On the card were wrestling journeymen Kid Cash and Johnny Swinger, both who had put pen to paper on a WWE developmental deal. Having both been around the metaphorical block a few times, they were able to not just get warmed up to the WWE way, but offer some guidance to some of Deep South's greenhorns. And who were these underdeveloped stars under development? Well, it was quite the cross-section of could-bes, will-bes, and never worse. The regulators, who would peak as Simon Dean's twin tragic tag team, the Gemini, were headliners against the high-impact tag team of... Uh, high impact. Earlier in the night, the freaking Deacon, basically Damien Demento, cosplayed by Doc Gallows, beat future wrestling cheerleader Nick Mitchell in dominant fashion, marking the first meeting between the Bullet Club and the Spirit Squad. Somewhere, I have a wrestling promoter with more money than sense is rubbing their chin and checking availability of their local armory. The opening match that night in September was won by the man who would go on to become the first Deep South heavyweight champion, million dollar tough enough runner-up Mike Mizanin. Despite losing out to Daniel Puder in this work shoot weirdness that was the reality show come job interview, WWE saw enough in Mizanin to sign him up to a developmental deal anyway. He was far from awesome, but he grew into his wrestling skin as champion with defenses against notable Deep South standouts like Kid Cash and the future Doc Gallows. Just five years after becoming Deep South champion, The Miz would rise all the way to the top and win his first WWE World Championship, going on to headline WrestleMania 27 a few months later. Whilst Miz would become one of the only WWE champs that Deep South would create, for now at least, I mean, I'm hoping you're watching this from the future, where the Jim and I have returned, and they have a Mega Powers-esque dust-up in the headline match at Raymond James Stadium for the big belt. They would help a future manager of champions find his niche. It was in 2005 that WWE signed an impressive relative unknown called Antonio Banks to a developmental deal. It was during Banks' stay in Georgia under the the watchful eye of Jody Hamilton that Banks would develop his most successful persona, Montel Vontavious Porter. Those chosen to hold the Deep South Championship had mixed levels of success beyond Georgia. Derek Nykirk, who dethroned The Miz, went on to have a glittering WWE run as, let me see this here, Paul Heyman security guard number two during the WWE reboot of ECW. Derek would drop the title to Rough House O'Reilly, who found some semblance of success as Connor in The Ascension. And later, with The New Day being a new dawn away, Xavier Woods would hold the distinction of being the final holder of the Deep South title. Deep South had a deep roster of mid noughties names during its brief life cycle. Guys like Kofi Kingston, Mr. Kennedy, Kurt Hawkins, Zack Ryder, and Brian Cage are just a few who spent time learning under the Deep South tree. Oh, and lest we forget, this is where we got our first taste of notable future Hall of Famer, SmackDown TV executive Palmer Cannon. Providing he keeps away from JBL during an international tour, I'm sure the future is looking bright for Palmer Cannon. Many have spoken out against trainer Bill DeMott and had reservations with DeMott's drill instructor-like training, an old-school approach to wrestling psychology. High-flying spectacular offense was discouraged in favor of slower, basic 
wrestling. And this led to a famous example of dissonance from a former member of the Deep South roster, a young and hungry Kenny Omega. Omega's briefest of dalliances in WWE developmental has been proudly shared on WWE.com. However, this story, chances are, you probably won't hear on the network anytime soon. Bill DeMott really did not like Kenny Omega's offense, saying that he was simply just too flashy. And when he heard about a match that Omega had put together for that night threw the whole thing out, telling Kenny to do, quote, no cool moves and simply work over a body part. That night, when Kenny went out, he did work a body part. He certainly did. He chose his opponent's backside to work. After multiple punches, kicks, and strikes to the rear of his opponent that night, Kenny Omega finished the match with a top rope atomic drop for the three counts. Not long after that, Kenny opted to leave Deep South Wrestling and try his luck on the circuit in Japan. The rest is very much history. No ifs or, um, buts. Another example of performance center posterior circumstances occurred in 2006 as a group of Deep South wrestlers, including Doc Gallows, Melissa Coates, and the future Zack Ryder, came up with a weird way to get out of a build -em up training day. Make a Deal Friday became a regular occurrence in Deep South Wrestling. This is where build -em up would challenge his trainees to do something ridiculous. If they did it, they would get the entire day off training. One infamous Make a Deal Friday saw DeMott offer a three-day weekend for everybody there under one condition, that Doc Gallo strips naked and gives the other trainees stink faces whilst they eat jelly-filled donuts. Feel free to take a second to maybe rewind the video and listen to that part again, just to make sure that you didn't mishear what was said. DeMott was divisive in his role as a Deep South trainer, having his own set of favorite trainees that he'd go drinking with until the early hours. DeMott and Hamilton both took exception to Bill Barron's work in character development. This led to arguments among management and confusion among the wrestlers. Many have since spoken out against Bill DeMott's bizarre, aggressive, bullyish approach to training talent. DeMott would end up leaving Deep South in early 2007, as more cases came out out of his ill treatment of the wrestlers. He was replaced in that role by Dr. Tom Pritchard. No naked jelly donuts under Dr. Tom's watch. By this point, though, a lot of the damage had already been done. Jody Hamilton and Bill Behrens were rarely seeing eye to eye on anything. Tommy Dreamer, liaising for WWE, was called into an emergency meeting where the problems behind the scenes began to affect the output. By the end of that meeting in 2007, the decision was made. Beyond repair and simply not hitting the mark with talent, the plug was being pulled on Deep South Wrestling. The shutdown itself was very sudden and lives in infamy. It was in late 2007 when John Laurinaitis called all the trainees to a meeting at the facility and informed them very bluntly that Deep South Wrestling was closed, effective immediately. Talent would be relocated to either Ohio Valley Wrestling once more or to new facilities being built in Florida. Laurinaitis told the trainees to start dismantling the ring and take the room apart. Kofi Kingston arrived that day, expecting expecting another day of in-ring practice. Just a few hours later, he was on the highway with a car full of metal folding chairs. TJ Wilson had turned up in his smart casual attire, thinking it was a rudimentary meeting. He was dirtying up his special occasion slacks very shortly after this as he was unscrewing the bolts of the Deep South Wrestling ring. Jody Hamilton packed up a few of his personal items and left, and very soon after, put in a call to his attorney. Hamilton filed a lawsuit against WWE for the way the shutdown of Deep South Wrestling was handled. His attorney claimed WWE officials had illegally entered the building that day and stolen wrestling paraphernalia that actually belonged to Hamilton. Also, by the company not giving Hamilton the required 90-day termination notice, they were in breach of contract. The lawsuit also claims, with confirmation by two anonymous WWE contracted stars, that Lauren has told talent that if they continue to work with Hamilton and in any capacity, they would never work for WWE. Unable to get the lawsuit dismissed, WWE eventually settled with Hamilton out of court for an undisclosed amount. 
By now, you'll know what the stars of Deep South Wrestling went on to do. Some went on to become champions in WWE. One went on to become a cornerstone of all elite wrestling. One went on to headline WrestleMania. One became a TV executive. I'm looking at you, Palmer Cannon. But what of the three heads that constantly butted backstage? Bill Behrens went on to work for TNA Wrestling. He's best known, by the way, as the man who discovered a young prodigy by the name of AJ Styles. Bill DeMott ended up back in WWE as a trainer between 2011 and 2015 when the company relaunched Tough Enough. However, more accusations came out about DeMott's poor conduct and ultimately he was fired once more. As for Jody Hamilton, the man behind the mask of the assassin, the man who created, then recreated Deep South Wrestling, he he passed away on August the 3rd, 2021, in hospice care at the age of 82. Lots of lessons were learned from Deep South Wrestling, and WWE had a better idea of what to cultivate and who to communicate with when Florida Championship Wrestling opened its doors, subsequently leading to the birth of NXT. Looking back, what is the true legacy of Deep South Wrestling? Was it that important step between Ohio and Florida? Is it the place where WWE champions would start to build what they would become? Or is it the place where Kenny Omega spent an entire match working someone's ass? Is that the real legacy of Deep South Wrestling? I'll let you decide. My name is Tom Campbell for Cultaholic Wrestling. Stay safe and love you. Bye.